Um, so a little bit of, uh, of context for the CUI. Most of the times we work uh, uh, with uh, cells and tissues, uh, but we have been having requests uh, to, to look at uh, materials in the context of cells and tissues. So I just want to show you a little bit the kind of work we can do and what you can achieve uh, if you want to, to use the CUI. So first, I just want to give a uh, introduce you to the CUI staff. Um, there's Roland Fleck in the middle, our director. Uh, then there's me as operations manager. We have uh, Claudine here at the bot at the top uh, right. She's our cryo specialist. Then we have uh, technical staff, um, mostly doing uh, room temperature EM work. Uh, Manu here, Ale and Lian, and we have our admin and finance person Gintare. Here at the bottom. So uh, your initial approach might, might be either with me, Roland or Gintare, and then you probably will get introduced by, to one of the members of the team for access to the facility. And um, the way we, we operate is that CUI works as a collaboration. Um, this is because most of the times uh, EM is not a uh, simple protocol and always requires some experimental design and some uh, some advanced data interpretation. So we like to uh, be as close to our users as possible and to give you all the support you need for your experimental design, data acquisition and also analysis, but also be involved as much as possible when you need to uh, to, to generate your papers or when you need to, to generate any type of publication. So usually we have a main uh, a main uh, CUI contact person that will be uh, helping you drive your project forward and always with uh, with the inclusion of our director. Uh, because we work a lot with uh, with cells and tissues, um, they are not the best uh, sample to put directly on a TEM or an SEM. There's uh, a variety of problems that we have to face here and we have to to always think about uh, uh, how we can improve the specimen preparation for each different specimen so problems among cells and tissues that when they are alive uh, they have no or low contrast when you want to do both tm and sem they are wet which is not very good to be inside the vacuum chambers and sometimes they can be very very large so for this, we have to go not directly to the TAM or SEM, but we have to go around and we have to deal with the specimen preparation. Uh, in a very streamlined way, this is usually three steps. First step is immobilization of the specimen. Second one is hardening, and hardening is important or mainly important when you need to do thinning of your sample uh, for TEM. Uh, and actually also for SEM, you might need to do some thinning of your sample or you need to have it in such a condition that the sample is not uh, evaporating under your, your electron beam. So for, for this context, we have some, uh, some different equipment. Um, there's not really too much to show you in terms of chemical procedures for immobilization, standard fixation. Of course, we have all the equipment, the safety and, uh, and the fume hoods. Also, all the, all, the, all the plastics you might need to embed your samples on. Um, but what I'd like to highlight a little bit today is our uh, tools for cryo immobilization. So this means that you can uh, get your cells in tissues. Uh, you can freeze them in a way where you don't form ice crystals so that when you get the samples back in the EM, you don't see any artifacts from ice formation. So your sample is uh, technically vitrified and it will look as close to native as possible. So we have two different types of uh, equipments where you can achieve uh, cell or tissue vitrification. One on the left is a plunge uh, freezing machine, so our Leica EM plunge freezer. On the right side, you can see the EM ice high pressure freezer. And the way you you do the different application for for this uh, for this uh, equipment depends actually on the sample size. So if you have very thin samples, you can just uh, uh, adhere them to a to a TM grid, and as you see here, quickly plunge it into a solution of liquid ethane, where your sample is going to be, be quickly vitrified, and you can just 
directly transfer this to the TDM if your sample is thin enough and just image directly. So I just don't like to thank James Torpy for this video of the demo of the of the plunge freezer. On the other hand, if your sample is too thick, it's going to be very difficult to achieve vitrification because it's really difficult to remove the heat efficiently from a sample before ice crystals start to form. So for this, we need a much bulkier equipment. We need to use our Leica EM ice high pressure freezer. Uh, this takes advantage of one of the properties of water that under high pressure it will uh, tend to vitrify instead of forming ice crystals. So what happens is that we can load samples that are up to 200 micron thick um, into some special carriers. We can even do uh, live culture of samples in these specific carriers. We load them into the, into the machine and then the samples are pressurized over 2000 bar and they get a jet of liquid nitrogen and this will achieve vitrification of the sample. Depending on uh, the, the method that we want to do next, we can keep both samples in cryo conditions or we can apply some chemicals to bring them back to room temperature or we can do some uh, uh, freeze drying to remove the water and go back to the EM or just looking at our dry contents. Whoop. Something that might be necessary depending on how you, you want to image your sample is uh, ultramicrotomy. So this is going to be an important step for thinning bulky specimens. And this is very important if you want to do TEM, but it might also be important if you need to shape your sample a specific size to load it in a, on an SEM chamber. So we are equipped with uh, uh, four uh, like uh, UC7s that run at room temperature. We have another UC7 that can run in cryo mode and also an uh, older model UC6 that can be also run in cryo mode. So you can achieve very thin samples both for room temperature and cryo. Let's say uh, routinely between uh, 50 to 500 nanometers. And this is using uh, special uh, diamond knives. So here you have to consider there's always a uh, uh, different uh, hardnesses of your tissue and uh, different ways that you want to shape it. So there's different knives for diff every different application. And this, this is going to be important um, depending on the type of sample that you use, recognizing which type of diamond knife you, you can use on a different microtone. So after specimen prep is finished, of course, we can go forward and do our imaging. We have a couple of imaging tools that might be uh, interesting for you. Uh, let's start with some SEM. So we have our new uh, benchtop SEM, uh, this JCM 5000 Neoscope. Um, you can get a secondary electron detector signal here, backscattered electron detector si signal, and you also can do some EDS. Um, this is a quite a nice system, uh, very easy to use. It's a very streamlined. It's also a very good uh, system for uh, new EM users. And uh, one of the advantages is that it can be easily operated uh, um, remotely. So what we can do for you is that we can load some samples in uh, and you can do your imaging from your office, from your home. So it doesn't require you to be on site all the time to, to, to visualize the samples from this system uh, because it's really easy to run. You just need a mouse and you need a good internet connection. We have also uh, some TEMs. Uh, first one, I'm going to focus here on the 1400. Actually, this is a uh, picture of a microscope that is not here anymore. It was our 1400 plus. Now we have a new model, the 1400 flash, with, which actually has a, a nicer detector. So if you are looking for your uh, high magnification uh, particles, you will also achieve a nicer contrast of the samples. Um, it's pretty much the same machine. So if you use the plus, uh, you'll be able to use the flash with it, with a five minutes intro. Uh, this is a very good machine for screening, and uh, our plans is also to implement uh, higher throughput uh, imaging methods uh, through some special software in this machine. And uh, we are trying to explore now if there's a chance to also be able to use remotely so that we can have a much efficient use of uh, out of office hours of this system. Uh, the other system, the final one I want to talk about, it's a, a bit a higher end machine. It's our 200 kV um, F200 or how we like to call it the F2. And it's um, TEM stem tomography uh, equipment. 
and it's equipped to do cryo EM, which means that you can keep your sample cold in a vitrified state, uh, just loading it in a cryo holder uh, and keeping it uh, at uh, almost liquid nitrogen temperature inside the chamber. So if you, for some reason, have a hydrated specimen that you cannot dehydrate and you want to keep it as native as possible, you can image with native conditions in this system and you can do both TEM or you can do STEM, you can do tomography, so get your tilt series and do 3D reconstructions. And you can also uh, do EDS in this system. So this might also be important if you have bulky specimens, you can section them, reduce the size and be uh, more precise of, of where you find your, your particles of interest or uh, having higher set resolution when you want to image those. In case you want to use CUI, I recommend that first you check our website. There's plenty more information that I didn't discuss right now here. And if you have any follow up questions, please just drop me an email. Also, if you are applying for grants and you want to do EM and you need to get information, uh, feel free to contact us and we are uh, here to help you. Thank you very much, Pereira. Um, does anyone have any questions? I certainly have a question. So I think this is this is a more logistical question, um, Pereira. So how long is the typical process time from initial contact with the CUI through to, say, final images and analysis, typically for average users? So this is actually can vary quite a lot. Um, at the moment, we are actually recruiting a new post, so hopefully it will be a little bit faster uh, than what it is now. Um, the way that we tend to, to operate also varies from project to project. One of our jobs is also to teach people and to help them become electron microscopists. So if you have a staff member that would like to dedicate more time, uh, it's, it might be quicker to come here, learn with us, shadow us for a couple of weeks, and then be a bit more independent. So we call this uh, super users. We have a few at uh, at any given point, or we can also do uh, all the EM work for you. And of course, this might take a little bit longer because we have to you have to keep track of, track of all the projects. I think at any given time we have at least ten projects running. Uh, something that I didn't discuss is that we also do some uh, diagnostics in parallel. So we have pathology work to 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 complement with this. So it's uh, it's always trying to keep the balance, but um, it really depends on the complexity of the study. Usually simpler studies also have higher throughput, so um, it might not take too long. I think turnover between a few weeks to a few months uh, to start to start to start first thing for getting your first data sets is, uh, is, uh, is feasible. It really depends on the question and on the project. Sure. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've just noticed a question in the chat from Professor Cacciali. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the uh, tomographic capabilities? Sure. So um, the system that I showed, you can um, you have uh, high tilt holders for them, and actually you can do uh, dual axis tomography. So you can achieve a very uh, high uh, Z resolution. Um, so I don't know if you're for those, for people who are not familiar with this technique, uh, you acquire a tilt series. Uh, imaging your sample inside the microscope and then using post-processing you do a computational method like back projection that will give you some virtual Z slices and the advantage here is that your Z resolution on the reconstruction side is going to be equal to your XY resolution so you're going to achieve isotropic data uh, from this method. Thank you very much, Pereira. I hope that answered your question. Just a, a quick addition is that the throughput, of course, is going to be way lower than uh, just a normal snapshot. Usually a tilt series might vary between half an hour to one hour acquisition time. This is without post-processing. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. OK, thank you, Pereira. Everyone can thank him. Um, we'll move on to the next talk by Dr. Ben Blackburn who's going to tell us about the Physics Small Research Facility at KCL. Um, so, I'm just going to be talking to you guys uh, today a bit about the uh, small research facility we have at uh, Clean's Close London Physics Department. 
so this is available to LCN members. Um, I'm just going to run through um, our devices fairly quickly um, and just so you get a good idea of what we've uh, got here. So the physics department was once based under this beautiful quad you see here, um, but that's now a building site and we've been moved into the basement of the adjacent building. Um, over time, we've taken over um, the majority of the three basement floors of the Strand building and most of the basement or some of the basement of the King's building. I'm not sure why we kept getting put in basements, but there it is. Um, the uh, physics department has uh, facilities available for electron microscopy, particle sizing, AFM, thermal evaporation, so um, fabrication and spectroscopy. Those uh, one by one. So firstly, we've got two electron microscopes. The first is a Hitachi S4000 uh, FEG. Um, this uh, is a very, very um, old reliable type machine. It's two years older than I am and still going. Uh, quick changeover and it's um, actually a, a very, very usable and um, I, I say user friendly machine. It's uh, very good and a favourite among our PhD students. Um, and one thing it's excellent for as well is teaching because the entire thing is analog. So there's an awful lot of good feedback. You can sort of you can see what you're doing with every switch. You get a good feel for how the electron microscope works in a way that with modern sense, there's a sort of a black box you never really get. I should say as well that this, um, unfortunately, as things days are numbered, we're in the process of replacing it with an all new um, electron microscope that should be coming in shared with the engineering department um, probably next year sometime. The other end of the spectrum, we have got um, this much newer electron microscope. This is a T-scan MIR-3 with a Delnick Spark cathodoluminescent spectrometer attached. Now, the Mira 3 is um, um, equipped with um, both secondary electron and backscatter uh, detection, um, resolution of 1.2 nanometers at 30 kilovolts. Um, it's got a very, very large uh, stage and no loading chamber. So you open it like an oven, you can load up. Um, probably about 10 samples onto a stage if you're creative and then you can image them all in one go, which means you can get a very high throughput of uh, samples uh, image using this thing. The um, blue box on the side is the uh, cathode luminescence spectrometer. And for those who don't know, cathode luminescence is basically spectroscopy done using the electromagnetic radiation that is produced by, um, by secondary emission electron microscopy. Um, so um, both of these uh, detectors, both of these electron microscopes take uh, one session of a few hours to uh, train people up on. And uh, then we have another session where myself or one of my colleagues will be looking over your shoulder to make sure that uh, you were listening the first time, basically. And then you should be free to book it at will. The, um, the CL, the cathode luminescence, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult to use. Um, it involves lining up an awful lot of small mirrors, one of which can very easily be crashed into a sample. And so we will usually go with um, three or four sessions before we're um, willing to let you book and use this on your own. Particle sizing, once again, we've got a, a complicated one, the simple one. The, um, I've just noticed the picture the wrong way around, never mind. The um, Zeta Sizer ZS Nano is a sort of quick and dirty particle sizer. Um, put, put your sample in your cuvette, uh, put it in and press the go button. It's also equipped to do uh, Zeta, size, Zeta potential measurements, which um, we have got disposable uh, cuvettes for, but they will cost uh, more if you want to use them. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got the Northern Nano Sight LM10, which is a, um, a much more advanced device that uses nanoparticle tracking analysis, which is a mixture of light scattering and Brownian motion to get a lot of information out about, uh, about particles. It can give you good, reliable um, data on size, concentration, as well as videos of particle motion. Um, the downside of this thing is it uses a single laser cell um, that you have to inject your sample into, and then between runs, you have to take it out, clean it, and fill it with the next sample, which can be very time consuming. So you might find that you don't get many samples looked at if you're using the LM10. Um, so the thermal evaporator, 
We have a label thermal evaporator in the uh, third basement. Uh, this is used for depositing thin films onto a suspended substrate above. Uh, we mostly use it for gold and aluminium, but it can also be used for chrome, uh, silver, uh, most metals. Um, the device is um, easy to use and gives you very good control over film thickness. Um, one downside is that you have to load it up and then leave it overnight to pump down in order to get uh, decent results with your films. So as a result, we charge for a single use for this because while you may be having to book it out for, say, 24 hours, you're probably only going to be using it for about half an hour there. Um, a target force microscopy. So we've got um, two AFMs that are currently in use. I'm not going to talk a huge amount about these because both of these are available at the LCM facility. And um, we went gone into quite a lot of detail about in the previous uh, meeting, which I believe is available on YouTube. Uh, we've got a dimension, a Brooker dimension and a Brooker multi-mode 8, um, both of which use scan assist and peak force tapping. Um, just in general in-house, the multi-mode 8 tends to be used for softer biological samples and the uh, dimension for hard nanoparticle samples, but that's more of an in-house preference. I think both can do both. Petroscopy, um, we've got a UV vis, near IR, double beam, um, Hitachi uh, spectrometer, spectrophotometer, which is um, once again another old reliable instrument, uh, very simple to use, very short training time, and a Hariba Fluramax emission spectrometer. Um, once again, these are very simple uh, spectrometers to use, and um, we can get you up and running and good to go in about uh, half an hour. Um, we have a Hariba Uvazil 2 ellipsometer. Um, this is situated in our clean room. The Uvazil 2 offers a tunable spot size and a spectral range of 150 to 2100 nanometers, uh, designed to look at nanoscale thin films. Now, um, while not a bad uh, bit of kit in theory, this has been quite a temperamental device, and we're currently in the process of hopefully getting it replaced with a newer model. So by all means, come in and we'll have a go at this, uh, getting some good data out. But there have been issues that we're trying to resolve. Uh, just quickly, because Wayne's going to be going into this in greater detail, detail we've got a um, Picasso R200 um, PALD plasma enhanced atomic layer deposition um, system set up in our clean room, which is used to produce highly bespoke thin films. We've got a range of um, reagent gases as well as um, ozone generation uh, for plasma-based reactions. And um, I think Wayne will be talking to you more about that. Uh, so thank you for listening. That is the, uh, um, the vast majority of our equipment here. Um, for a full price list for our facility, please visit the website on screen. Um, to book any of our equipment or to just come in and have a look, do a, um, a free sample session, you can contact myself or one of the other technicians here, Dr. Jenny Train and Mr. Bill Luckhurst, and we will um, sort out a visit for you. I should say as well, um, with COVID coming to hopefully coming to an end, um, it shouldn't be too much of an issue in the future, but um, we've managed to get quite good at um, training people using the one meter plus rule where possible and where not possible. We've got quite a robust virtual training system set up um, for users. So even if the device is in a very small room and not particularly accessible, we can probably get you going. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for that talk, Ben. So I think it's, it's probably good to point out that the Physics Small Research Facility will be renamed the LCN Strand Research Facility in the very near future due to the incorporation um, of our new engineering department as well. So you mentioned at the very beginning, Ben, so I'm going to start off with one question, the old reliable Hitachi SEM. So I believe there are plans to replace that instrument. Yes. Sure. So. That's going to be replaced with a, a similar instrument, obviously a lot more uh, a lot more modern. I, I think probably a geol, but there's a bit of back and forth here, and that's going to be shared with the engineering department. But it will remain where the current Hitachi is in the physics nanobotonics lab suite. Sure, thank you very much. And there will likely be an update when they have installed their new equipment as well, which will also be shared via the LCN. Absolutely. That's 
not coming online for a while, I don't believe. Okay, are there any other questions for Ben? There was something there briefly. Oh. In the chat. Nothing in the chat. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ben. Okay, so it's it's now over to me. So if you give me one moment and I will share my screen. I've already introduced myself. My name is Dr. Wayne Dixon from the Photonics and Nanotechnology Group at King's College London. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about our plasma enhanced atomic layer deposition facility and our, clean, our new clean room at KCL. So we have this installed in a 65 meter squared combined ISO 5 and ISO 7 clean facility. And the two spaces aren't physically separated. They're separated by um, laminar flow and air exchange management in the room. So the PALD sits, of course, in the ISO 5 region of the clean room. And the clean room itself, as you can see from this image, still has a lot of space. And I'll talk a little bit about our future plans for some of this space at the end of today's talk. So here's a, a nice picture of the service chase. So of course, this is a very new facility and it comes with all the mod cons. So our clean room engineer is Ben, who you've just met in the previous talk. And Ben monitors all the performance metrics of the clean room remotely. So it's a very advanced system. So if anything goes wrong, he immediately receives any updates on the conditions of the room by both SE, SMS and also by email as well. And of course, the PALD, which is a PicoSun R200 system, is private place in the clean room at the moment. So it's fully installed. And thanks, unfortunately, thanks to the pandemic, it has yet to undergo commissioning. But we hope that will take place in the very near future. So you can see that it's, it's very well equipped with many different process gases, and Ben alluded to a few of them. And towards the end of my talk today as well, I mentioned the list of initial materials which we hope to deposit using this machine. However, for those of you that aren't familiar with the ALD process, there's a basic schematic here illustrating how it works. So it's a cycle by cycle process in contrast to a lot of other physical vapor deposition techniques. So you can see that the first process is a pulse of the initial element. In this case, it's just simply called element A. Of course, it can vary quite a lot, which either physio or chemo absorbs on the surface of your substrate. Following that, we introduce another a uh, reactive gas, which of course binds to this molecule, and then using either a thermal pulse or a plasma pulse, a reaction takes place and we deposit a single monolayer of the target material on the substrate. So of course this allows for sub-nanometer control of the material thicknesses. And because it's using a, a chemisorb or a physisorb process, this of course allows us to, create, uh, to deposit on very high aspect ratio substrates as well. The advantages of initiating these reactions using a plasma is that the temperature can be kept to a minimum. So this allows a wide variety of different materials to be deposited on. So of course, there's a wide variety of typical substrates. So up to 200 millimeter single wafers, 3D objects, of course, because of the process. So we avoid all shadowing that normally happens with physical vapor deposition. In fact, these systems can even coat powders and particles, and that um, goes down to the nano size. So there's quite a lot of literature out there on using PLD to coat nanopowders, usually titanium dioxide, but as I say, other substrates and other materials are certainly possible. Um, naturally, in the, the substrate holder, we can do many batches for very small wafers. So that's very useful if you want to produce multiple samples where then you want to take that and vary another step in the process later on. And of course, as I mentioned already, the high aspect ratio, this can be up to 1 in 2,500 typically. So this covers an awful lot of the aspect ratios that we would normally use and even pseudo three-dimensional nanostructured materials. So of course, the processing temperature can be controlled within a wide range, and this is one of the reasons we can do many different processes. And there's a list of typical materials here, and the list is really quite endless. So if you do have something in mind, the first 
step is to either check the literature and then get in, of course, get or get in touch with us. And if we don't know, we'll certainly contact Pico Sun, who are very, very good at sharing information on, on the latest recipes for diff the deposition of, of many different materials as well. Of course, with a plasma process, the number of different materials that you can deposit is very wide indeed. Um, and even some complicated chemistries are possible. And I'll show you a couple of the more interesting materials, at least from my point of view, as we go through the talk. So, of course, as I mentioned, one of the major advantages of um, atomic layer deposition in general, um, whether it's either thermal or plasma, is the ability to coat very high aspect ratio three-dimensional three structures with very thin nanometric and sub-nanometric layers. So you can see some nice images uh, as examples here, which have been all provided by PicoSun. As I say, we're waiting to get our hands on our own instrument ourselves. So here for some standard materials, you can see how well this conformal process works, particularly at these corners where the deposition thickness doesn't stray too far from the overall thickness. I think there's a, a deviation of around two nanometers in these examples as well. And these are some of the standard processes. For example, aluminium oxide, half neum oxide are, are very common materials to deposit um, using PALD. And of course, you can deposit more um, non-conventional materials. So here's titanium nitrate, which is a plasmonic material, in fact. Um, and you can see this is deposited in a multi-layer at a very high aspect ratio corner trench here. So you can see how well the, the layers conform to this high aspect ratio structure. <clears throat> now, I did mention that um, because of the plasma enhanced process, some materials that can't be deposited using normal thermal ALD can be deposited with plasma, and that includes metals. So, for example, on the left-hand side here, we see a, a full 200 nanometer wafer, which has been deposited with gold, and this has been carried out by Professor Sean Barry at Carleton University in Canada. And this is someone who's providing us with our precursor for our gold deposition. As I say, you'll see that towards the end of my talk. And in fact, even uh, graphene and other two-dimensional materials can be deposited using PALD as well. And this of course, moves into all sorts of calcogenide materials can be done as well. So if you're interested in those, please do get in touch. And even if the material you're interested in is not currently available due to some challenging chemistry, there's a really active community out there uh, developing new chemistries for all sorts of materials. So probably and hopefully most materials in the library will be covered in the near future. Now, of course, there's both some disadvantages and advantages um, to these materials. Um, so here's some of them listed here. So of course, the advantages is large substrates, polymers, and even particle coating is possible. The chemistries are typically, and the depositions are typically very reproducible. So the, the machine allows you to control pulse pressures, pulse volumes um, to very, very uh, high sensitivity. And this means that the recipes are typically very, very reproducible. There's generally excellent control of nucleation, although for some, some of the newer materials, for example, gold, it remains to be seen how this translates across different substrates, for example, and that's something that we're going to look into. But of course, in, in some instances as well with this process, because it's cycle by cycle, you can have almost atomic control of your thicknesses as well. And in terms of the conformality to high aspect ratio surfaces, um, it's unmatched really by any other um, deposition technique. <clears throat> of course, it comes with some disadvantages as well. So special reactants are required, which can be expensive. <clears throat> and this is particularly the case for materials where the chemistry is quite new, because the economy of scale simply isn't there to translate into lower cost. The reactants are very toxic. Um, that's another problem as well, but that's been taken care of with um, various chemisorb substrates for all the reactant gas, which all the reactant gases pass through before being exhausted on the roof of the building. Um, deposited layers can sometimes have impurities naturally by the carrier molecule, which is um, which is holding the, the atom of interest. Sometimes you can have residues from some of those, and it's also quite a slow process. So it's not really suitable for thicker layers, and what thickness will really depends on the material here as well. Um, so please do get in touch if you have something in mind or you want um, a particular thickness, but if you're not sure if it fits within the remit um, for PALD or not. So just to mention some of the initial materials that we'd like to deposit with the PALD. So we're starting with a rather limited catalog. So I think we're starting with a, a total of six. Um, but of course, it's possible to store these precursors. So we do hope to expand that um, as our user base uh, begins to grow and needs emerge, particularly if they're common needs that, that span across several different users. 
So the first one, of course, is aluminium oxide because it's a very standard process in ALD. Hafnium oxide is included as well. And then we have two nitrides, which we will deposit. So aluminium nitride, as well as gallium nitride, and of course, the famous gold, because I work in plasmonics and nanophotonics, a very interesting material. And as Ben mentioned, we will have bismuth as well, which we will use to deposit bismuth diselenide with H2S gas. And of course, there's others for you to decide. So we wish to maximize the user base of the equipment. So we're very happy to try to satisfy any material requests that, that you present. And if also, please do get in touch if you have any contamination issues, um, cross-contamination issues with any of the materials that we wish to deposit as well. Okay, or any other questions indeed about this device. So as Ben mentioned, as part of the Strand Research Facility, um, we do have a variable angle ellipsometer available. So this works in a wavelength range from 200 nanometers to approximately two micrometers. Um, so it allows you to obtain thickness refractive index from any films that you do deposit using PLD. So you can check for any and homogeneities in the film, and you can also check it on uniformity across a wafer, for example, or you can also use it to extract the refractive index, which can give you hints if there's any impurities present in your sample. So you can use this, of course, before and after deposition, which is really useful as well. And as Ben mentioned, there's an AFM suite nearby, so you can do surface topological investigations of your substrates before and after deposition, if you so wish as well. So just like to now discuss some of our future plans for the clean room as well. So we do plan currently to install a complementary physical vapor deposition system. As I mentioned, PLD is really only suitable for a few tens of nanometers at, at most for some of the materials. Otherwise, it does get very slow and can get very expensive as well for some of the materials, in particular gold, I think, because as I say, the precursor is not yet manufactured at scale. So we're hoping for a four magnetron system with, with two um, RF and DC power supplies, um, which we hope to equip with a 150 millimeter argon ion gun as well, and um, with substrate cooling for ion milling considerations as well. Um, so, of course, this will enable us to deposit much, much thicker films. Um, we're hoping to do even pulsed sputtering with this as well, pulsed DC sputtering. Um, but if anyone within the LCN has any comments on, on specification for a future magnetron-based machine, then please do get in touch with us as well. It's been a very long time since I pulled the user base of LCN for any requests like that. So um, we're still hoping to secure the funding for this. So do let me know if you have any particular requirements for the specification. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their attention and I welcome any and all questions. Thank you. Um, question I see from Professor Cacciali again. So the current the current equipment um, or ellipsometer, I do think has a beam spot size, which is controllable. I think it can go down to around five micrometers. However, from experience, the signal to noise ratio is almost unusable at that spot size. Um, and I'm not sure if we'll have that capability in an upgraded instrument. Um, is there any particular resolution that you had in mind? Sorry. It, sorry, it might be easier if I just uh, speak up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, OK. Um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, one micron would be ideal, but uh, I, I guess we will. Uh, we, we might be able to live with whatever you can offer. So do you think 10 microns would be OK? I think it should be OK. Again, it, you know, as you, if you're aware of ellipsometry, Franco, you understand the issues. It really depends on, on what you're trying to, the, the system you're trying to prove. If it's a bulk substrate, well, it's, it's got really high index, that's probably very straightforward at that. Or if it's a, a bulk substrate which is covered by a high contrast layer with a sufficient thickness, it's probably pretty easy as well. If it's a very faint layer, layer with faint refractive index contrast, it could be more difficult, as I say, simply because of signal to noise ratio. Sure, sure. So it's okay. worth a try, in other words. It's, yeah, I'll be in touch. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, a question from Milo as well. Oh, hi there. I was just curious what you were saying about ALD of graphene. How does that work? I mean, normally I would think I would need a higher temperature to make an ordered layer, and it's not exactly classic. ALD yeah. So, so this this is not something I have much knowledge on, Milo, unfortunately. But I can certainly I can certainly provide you with the reference for where that image is taken from. It's I'm not sure how the material chemistry works, but I think it's enabled by the plasma, which mm -hmm. which generates quite a, a lot of high energy at the surface. Okay, interesting. 
Sorry, I can't give you more information. No, no worries. So are there any other questions on our PALD for the moment? Um, if I may jump in again, <laughs> sorry, I don't sure. want to hijack the <laughs> questions time. Um, um, uh, uh, I, I was wondering, uh, uh, sorry, and then I, I uh, got distracted. Uh, um, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, do you have any plan for magnesium oxide, for example? Um, that's certainly possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Oxides tend to be some of the, the least challenging materials to deposit, and I think magnesium is included in, in the list of possible PALD materials. I have no idea of the conditions for the precursor, but I can certainly find out. Sure. Okay, thanks. I think it's perfectly possible. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. If no one has any further questions, I'd like to thank our earlier speakers, Pereira and Ben. So thank you very much to both of those. And please do get in touch either directly to myself, Ben or Pereira, um, or just via the CUI website in the case of the, the Center for Ultrastructural Imaging, um, or even via Megan as well, when ALD will be available. So that's a good question, Milo. So I think probably I could pass that question to Ben if he's still here. Ben, have we any updates? Hi. Yeah. So um, the sort of the process of getting it set up has been extremely challenging, mainly due to COVID. Um, there's a, there's a remaining issue with the exhaust that I'm in the process of um, clearing up, and we made a lot of progress in the last couple of weeks. So I'm hoping to. Um, get the commissioning off the ground, um, hopefully by the end of the month, which will, by the end of the next month, we've got a day left. Um, that would be um, my best guess so far. I've got some people to talk to regarding that. I need to talk to uh, Pika Sun and uh, get them in. But after that, and obviously these things, these types of experiments, they're not the sort of thing you can just come in and just slap something on. So even before we've gotten the thing fully operational and ready to go. I would love to talk to some people and start to plan stuff. There's, I, I think it would be extremely good to do so. So even if it's not fully good to go right now, please don't hesitate to get in touch because I said, I'm very hopeful it will be soon now. It's, it's been a bit of a journey, but I think we're nearly there. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, so yes, Milo, if, if you're interested, please do go ahead and get in touch as soon as possible. Okay, thanks. Pleasure. Okay, if we've no further questions, I'd like to thank everyone again and thank you for your very interesting questions. And I hope some of you will be in touch to use some of the equipment. So have a lovely afternoon. Thanks to everyone. Bye bye.